Hi, I'm Katie, and I'm really excited to be part of this NeuroCrowd Ireland event. I'm going to be talking to you today about sensory processing, how it connects to emotional regulation and everyday function, particularly for neurodivergent people, because we tend to experience our senses different to neurotypicals. Before I get into the, the nitty gritty, I'm going to introduce myself. So as I said, I'm Katie, uh, Katie Curley. I'm an occupational therapist and I'm the clinical director of Horizons Therapy Services in Dundalk. I've been an occupational therapist for longer than I care to admit and I really love it. Uh, I'm multiply neurodivergent. I found that I was dyspraxic while I was studying to be an occupational therapist and I'm currently exploring my autistic identity. I'm very passionate about working with neurodivergent people and to help them be the best and most satisfied version of themselves. I specialize in sensory processing and how it affects meaningful occupation. Uh, if I'm honest, sensory processing is probably a special interest of mine. I tend to have a lot of like deep passion for neurology, anthropology and evolution and sensory processing is connected to so much of that. Uh, I'm overly enthusiastic, which you will see as I continue through this video. So I hope you enjoy this journey as much as I am definitely going to enjoy sharing it with you. So. I have a, a few kind of issues with how we talk about sensory processing. Um, people tend to talk about the word sensory um, and they tend to overuse it. It's a very big buzzword at the moment, especially um, in communities where we talk about people who have different needs. Um, but all humans are sensory experiencing beings in a sensory rich world. Most of our experiences come from our senses and our world is jam packed full of sensory information. I have a big issue with things like, you know, for example, sensory rooms, um, that description kind of gets on my nerves because <laughs> all rooms are sensory rooms. Every room will have sensory information in it. Every environment will have sensory information in it. So almost all of our experiences are either informed by sensations or cause us to experience sensations. The world we live in is jam packed with sensory information as are our own bodies. So anything with the central nervous system does sensory processing. So basically with sensory processing, what happens is your information, your sensory information is detected by your senses of which there are many. I will talk about those soon. And then your central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord processes this information, figures out what it means, sees if, it, if it's relevant and if you need to respond to it. Sometimes the response is to filter out that information. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about all of our senses, or most of our senses, um, as I continue through this video. So, information from both research and the actually autistic community indicates that autistic people process more sensory information than neurotypicals do. That is to say that we filter a little bit less. So we tend to let in more information from our senses. So neurodivergent people are generally known to process sensory information differently to neurotypicals. But I also feel at this point in time, it's really important to say that all human beings have quirks in their sensory processing. And that's what makes us different and unique from each other. If we all had the same sensory processing, we would all like the same things. We would all do the same behaviors and that would make the world quite boring. So even things down to what food we like, that's connected to our sensory processing. Food is a multi-sensory experience. We see the food before we eat it. We smell it and that stimulates our hunger. We taste it and then we, we also um, we feel the texture of it. So there's so many senses involved in just eating. And that's a very basic activity that people do <laughs> multiple times a day, uh, definitely in my case. So um, when you're processing emotion or sensory information different to neurotypicals who obviously make up the majority, um, that can affect your emotional state and that can impact on stress levels. And the irony of that is that your emotional state and your stress levels will change your sensory processing as well. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario sometimes. So sometimes we talk about neurodivergent people having different sensitivities. So we have different neurological thresholds thresholds for sensory information. We also can have different emotional calibration. So maybe our emotional responses are graded differently to maybe what neurotypicals might expect. Um, we also have to consider long-term effects of stress and trauma, um, including masking on sensory processing. So it's very, very tangled in our emotional states. It's very tangled in our stress, our experiences. So it's very hard to have um, a conversation about anything meaningful without including some form of sensory processing in it. 
So um, I know Neurodiver um, Neuropride Ireland have put together some really amazing information about different types of neurodivergencies. And there are a lot, as you can see, there are more than this too. So again, we know that neurodivergent people tend to process sensory information differently to neurotypical. So I have a kind of a connection between sensory processing and evolution. This is super cool because our sensory processing got us from prehistoric times to where we are now. As I go through the different senses, I will pepper in information about evolution and why humans experience senses the way we did and the way we do now. I will also allude to the fact that due to other forms of evolution, for example, example technological evolution, some of our sensory processing is a little bit lagging behind or it's maybe suited to a different time in history. So in theory, many neurodivergent people presently experience sensory processing that would have been part of our ancestors' survival mechanisms, which I think is very interesting. There's a lot of talk about, you know, neurodivergent people having evolved alongside neurotypicals. There's a lot of talk that we are needed, we are necessary, we are beneficial for the survival of humans. And some of the sensory processing information kind of confirms that. So I think that's a fun thing to think about. So is our current sensory process in the remnants of why our species has survived thus far? It's possible. So neurodivergence have always been important for the survival of humanity. So um, what is sensory process? And I've kind of touched on this a little bit already. So what happens is we process information from multiple senses. So everybody knows our five basic senses that we are taught about in school of touch, taste, sight, smell, and hearing. Most people are less familiar with vestibular proprioception and interoception. So I'll do a bit of a deep dig into those ones today. These senses are all tangled in each other. There is no part of your brain that is responsible solely for processing one type of information. They're connected because the world is connected. You know, there's information around us all the time. And if we were to separate it out in our brains, if we would be pretty slow at processing. There are even more senses than what are shown on this diagram, but I'm not gonna go into those today because this talk will be too long and some of it is speculation. So like I mentioned, our senses are intertwined and entangled in one another. They don't exist in isolation. So senses are interpreted and processed across multiple organs and across multiple regions of the brain. I see a typo there. I'm just going to take a deep breath and move on from it. So this is deliciously complicated. So what's so cool about this is we have multiple sensory organs, including our skin, including our ears, um, and our ears are pretty cool because they process auditory information and also vestibular information. So I will get into that again as we continue to talk. So other organs involved in sensory processing are obviously our eyes, um, our muscles, our joints and our tendons, our nose, our tongue, all these things are involved in sensory processing. And then this information is detected in these sensory receptors in these organs. And then that information is sent by neural pathways or it is sent to the brain where neural pathways are made in between different regions of the brain to connect this information so that we process more smoothly. I'm really, really dumbing it down. You could talk about this for weeks and weeks and weeks and we would never ever get to the bottom of it. It is so complicated and it is such a beautiful process, multiple beautiful processes in fact. So uh, something that I think is overlooked a lot is that senses and emotions are so connected that we can't really disentangle them. Our senses and our emotions are always connected. So our sensory process and our, and our emotional development are, or our emotional regulation are hand in hand throughout the lifespan. They are never apart. So emotions and senses are connected in, in quite interesting ways. So senses play an integral role in our emotional processing, our learning and our interpretation. So emotional reactions can be guided by sensory information. For example, that food looks gross, I feel disgust. Or that hug feels nice, I feel content. That sound was sudden, I feel alarmed. There's so many things and we call this a conceptual association. So what we see might trigger an emotion. What we hear might trigger an emotion. And this is so fascinating. We never ever have this apart. And other things that are, um, are part of this is that emotions can cause our senses to change. For example, on a day when you are really stressed out, Maybe you haven't slept, 
maybe you're hungry, maybe they, you have a deadline looming and you're rushing and a person comes up and taps you on the shoulder, you might have a bit of a startle response or an irritation response or even a, an alarm response. Um, whereas on a day maybe where you were feeling relaxed and calm and someone taps you on the shoulder, you might be able to tolerate that just fine. So our emotions do impact how our senses actually interpret information from our environment. So um, a thing that I feel I maybe should have mentioned and I didn't, it's not in any of my slides, but I'm just going to throw it in here, is synesthesia. So synesthesia is interesting and it's a form of neurodivergence as well. It also is more common in neurodivergent people. So synesthesia is where one sense causes a reaction in another sense or causes you to experience another sense. For example, being able to see sounds or to see music um, or being able to smell an emotion, that sort of stuff. So um, um, it's where one sensory modality impacts and causes you to experience another sensory modality. And what's interesting about this is that in a way, uh, this is somewhat hypothetical, but I doubt I'm alone in thinking this, is language is kind of a form of synesthesia because what happens when we hear sound and it is just auditory information our brain interprets this and then we have emotional responses sometimes we have a visual response for example if somebody describes a metaphor to you like for me i'm quite a visual thinker if someone tells me that they wear their heart on their sleeve in my mind i will see a bloody anatomical heart safety pinned to a person's sleeve and that is a constant for me so i know a lot of us do tend to um interpret senses in different ways so that's just a personal example, I suppose. So this is another example, and this is from a comic called Strange Planet by Nathan W. Pyle. These are adorable little aliens, and they talk about human behavior in the most quirky way. I absolutely love these guys. So in this particular comic, we have these two little aliens having this chat, and they are one of them is listening to music. So he's saying to the other person, or the uh the fellow alien, I want you to hear the vibrations that affect my emotions. So the music, the auditory stimulation is happening by vibrations in the air that then hit the eardrum, that then send information to your brain about the sound that you are hearing. And <laughs> this little alien in the sense of the other one, so my senses will also be affected and this person or this alien is saying it all goes to plan. And then the upshot is that this is making me sad. And this little alien is saying that they listen to it when they're sad. So to compound your sadness, exactly. So um, that's another example of senses affecting emotions where music is really known for this. Music can impact our emotional state. And um, sometimes we choose to listen to um, particular music that exacerbates the emotions that we're feeling or music maybe that changes the emotions we're feeling. For example, I'm prone to listening to quite angry music when I'm angry, but sometimes I listen to heavy metal just when I'm in a good mood as well. Um, there also might be a case where you might decide to try and listen to a cheerful tune if you're in a bad mood. Now for me, that would make my bad mood worse. But again, who am I to say your sensory processing is wrong? Because it's not. So um, this next slide is to kind of illustrate that mental health is physical in terms of our sensory processing. So we often talk about sensory processing um, as a kind of a standalone thing, and it really isn't. We talk about, you know, sensory processing quirks causing stress and anxiety and different, ex different responses and reactions to environmental stimuli. But other thing is that mental health can actually cause differences in sensory processing. For example, depression can feel like your body is heavy, you can have fatigue and exhaustion with depression. Sometimes you can get headaches. Certainly anxiety is known for causing stomach aches, headaches, painful jaw and teeth from clenching, bitten fingers from biting your nails, cramps, restless legs, stuff like this. And another thing that people don't talk about enough when they talk about sensory processing is hallucinations. Hallucinations are when we experience sensory um, our brains experience sensory stimulation when maybe an external stimulus wasn't there. And I think this is really important to know. Um, many years ago, I was very lucky to work with a person who was an expert in hearing voices. And she was, I was a student at the time, so, you know, ignorant. Um, and she went to great lengths to explain to me that the voices that these people heard, uh, we were working mainly with people who were schizophrenic, that the voices that they heard are real. And what really kind of blew my mind, obviously I'm like a big science seeker, um, is that in an fMRI, so a functional MRI, magnetic res resonance imaging, 
um, a person's um, when they hear voices, if they're in an fMRI, the parts of their brain that process sound and voices will actually light up and be activated. So those voices are real to them. Their sensory experiences are real. And again, like I mentioned, because sensory processing is so unique and individual to each person, we're not ever really in a position to say to somebody that their sensory processing is wrong. And I think that's really important to remember when we are talking about mental health and disruptions to what we think is typical sensory processing. So... I'm going to move on to some of the individual senses. I feel like I've done a bit of a, an info dump on uh, various ways sensory processing is, um, is uh, present in our daily life. So I'm going to talk a little more about our senses. So this is um, The Pyramid of Learning by William, Williams and Schellenberger. And I use this a lot in, in the clinic when I'm trying to explain sensory processing. Part of it is because I like to have a visual to explain things a bit more clearly, but also it stops me going off on a tangent, like talking about what happens to your ears in space. But you guys might be the right audience for that. So maybe I will discuss what happens to our ears in space. So basically this is like a pyramid. So it's a hierarchy. It's similar to Maslow's hierarchy, except this is more physical. So um, our sensory systems so we have olfactory which is smell visual which is sight auditory which is sound gustatory which is taste tactile which is touch, touch vestibular which is balance it's actually more than balance it's balance sense of movement and it actually impacts attention and concentration we will get there and then proprioception which kind of is our body awareness so these are like foundations and then these are foundations that kind of anchor us in the world. They help us understand time and space. They help us figure out what's going on around us. And then there are other things built on top of this, like, you know, body schemes to so know where all your body parts are, bilateral coordination, being able to coordinate the left and the right sides of your body, motor planning, so being able to actually plan your movements all the way up to hand-eye coordination, language skills, activities of daily living living behavior and academic learning and I would like to just include uh, like learning in general they're not just academic so like skill learning and stuff like that as well is important so you can see there's kind of a, a foundation here with sensory processing so I'm going to talk about vestibular first of all I'm quite interested in the vestibular system I know it's so weird to say that I'm interested in one particular system but the vestibular system is really really cool so the vestibular system is in our inner ear. That's where the sensory receptors are, where the organs that detect vestibular information live. They are our semicircular canals and a little tiny thing called an otolith. So these are tiny, tiny, minuscule little organs that are inside our inner ear. And in here we have tubes. So the tubes and our semicircular canals are sort of at different angles to each other. And they're hollow and they're coated with hair fibers called cilia on the inside. And inside there, there is liquid. And that liquid moves when our head moves. So that information then is processed by the bending of the hair fibers, which then send electrical impulses to the brain to say that you're moving and how you're moving. So for example, my vestibular system right now knows that I am upright, but it's not detecting anything else because I'm not moving and I'm not in an unusual body position. Um, I, I kind of a good enough example of day-to-day -day life where you would experience vestibular system or vestibular processing in, not in isolation, but um, Okay, I'll scrap that bit. Um, a day-to-day -day example of the vestibular system in action is if you are the passenger in a moving vehicle and your eyes are closed, you can feel it turning the corner. You can feel it going around a bend. You can feel it going over a bump and you can feel it going around a roundabout. It feels like it's in your stomach and there is a connection there, which is really interesting. And I won't go into that one just now, but that is in your ear. Your ear is feeling that movement and telling your brain that you're moving. So another example, and I'm going to use more vehicles um, on a boat if you can't see the movement. For example, if you're below deck, you can still feel the movement of the boat. You can feel the movement of the waves. Um, also, if you're on an airplane and you're not at a window, you can feel takeoff and landing and you can feel turbulence. We can't feel um, a certain form of velocity called terminal velocity. And that's when we are no longer accelerating and we're kind of moving um, at a steady a steady pace and the liquid in your ear actually thinks that is a sedentary. So after a while, if you're up in the air on a plane, it feels like like you're okay um, or like you're not moving. So um, our sense of movement is fascinating. This is a very, very, very old sense that we have had really, really, really um, a lot of involvement with since prehistoric times. So uh, a fun thing to know is that if you take a person who has never been in a vehicle before, they will definitely vomit. Or if you take a person from, I don't know, prehistoric times who's never been in a vehicle before and you put them in a car, they will definitely vomit. So the thing is, 
your vestibular system and your eyes work together in a car to tell you that you are moving, um, but it also tells you that you're moving too fast for a human body. And this is very confusing to your brain. So your brain usually then tells your stomach to throw up so that it kind of stops in your tracks. It also sometimes thinks that you may have been poisoned. And the reason for that is that the liquid in your ear it tends to get thinner with poison. It also gets thinner with alcohol. So that's why we sometimes, well, why we lose our balance when we're past a certain point of um, alcohol consumption. So once that liquid gets thin, um, the brain thinks you've been poisoned. So if it starts sloshing around a lot um, inside those um, semicircular canals, your brain starts to panic and think that you definitely need to vomit and then you will throw up. It's the same as what happens to astronauts um, when they're initially doing their training. They have to get used to that strong sense of movement because in zero gravity, what happens is the liquid inside your ear is uh, no longer, um, it's no longer um, being pulled down by the force of gravity. So what happens is it's floating around on the inside and it's bouncing around all the edges of your, um, all the edges of your semicircular canals and telling your brain that you've been poisoned, so you better throw up. So uh, I personally would love to give the vomit comment a go, but I know I would be very sick. <laughs> So um, the other thing about the vestibular system is that it is connected to balance. And the reason for that is that these organs sort of act like, the, um, like a spirit level. So once your head starts to chip out of the midline and the liquid starts to sort of move, um, your brain either um, tells you to stick out an arm or a leg if you're definitely going to hit the ground, or the ideal scenario is that you pull yourself back up to midline so that you don't fall over. So people with vestibular process and difficulties may find that balance is hard for them and testing balance is a pretty good way to test for vestibular processing quirks and um, so um the biggest thing though that most people who have vestibular processing quirks experience is difficulty with attention and concentration and the reason for this is that humans never evolved to sit still so we are very um very kind of at odds with our <laughs> our neurology right now with how we live our lives so we very quickly um the world around us has changed to encourage us to sit more we spend more time sitting probably than any of our ancestors in previous generations ever have so humans evolved to be mobile active creatures we evolved to be hunters and gatherers so what happened then was our vestibular system helped us stay alert so maybe we were running through a forest, maybe we were chasing something that we were planning to kill and eat, or maybe something was chasing us with the intention of killing us. So what would happen then would be at that high speed movement, um, we would be making quick reactions and we would be responding quickly to our environment. So an example would be if you're chasing something that you want to kill and eat, you um, if a branch pops up out of nowhere or a big rock and you don't dodge it, maybe you fall over it, your food gets away and maybe you starve to death. Maybe your whole family, your whole tribe starves to death. So, you know, survival of the fittest required your vestibular system to be fast. So what happened then when we sat still later on was our vestibular system detected no movement and said, right, now it's time to rest, turn off, relax, that sort of stuff. So modern adults, what happens to a lot of us is when we sit still to watch TV, uh, we fall asleep. Or the alternative, and this is um, true for me, and I think maybe many of you could relate to this, is we can't sit still, so we're fidgeting. So I'm sitting here doing an awful lot of like leg fidgeting because if I sit still for too long, I will um, really have a hard time. So our, my vestibular system wants me to move, and right now I can't. So uh, managing the vestibular system in real life, movement is key. So it doesn't really matter how big or small the movement is, but sitting still for hours at a time will definitely affect our vestibular system negatively and this in turn will actually affect our mental health because we did not evolve to be sedentary so why do we fidget we fidget because we have an innate drive to move uh, many neurodivergent people seem to have this drive more than neurotypicals do and um, why do we daydream the same when we sit still for too long our brain isn't stimulated enough so it chooses to daydream to keep itself occupied the human brain loves to be occupied I don't know if any of you have ever tried a sensory deprivation tank. I have not because the thought of it scares the absolute bejeepers out of me. But um, a lot of people will, um, one of the points of it is that you will daydream. I don't know if daydream is the right word, but you will experience other sensory information, sometimes called sensory hallucinations. So um, 
yeah, the human brain just wants to be occupied. It is a busy little bee in there and it just wants to be engaged in something all the time. Vestibular is something that we need to be really considerate of. So for example, if you have a high neurological threshold for vestibular information, a desk job might not be your jam. Or if you have a desk job, you might want to consider things like getting up to go for a walk during the day, like a movement break. Um, other things might be um, having movement based hobbies. So, you know, even high intensity hobbies like skydiving, rock climbing, running, walking, all of that. It doesn't matter. You can tailor your vestibular experiences to suit what you like. But it is so important that you have them, that you do not sit still. Being a couch potato will absolutely damage your mental health and your vestibular system will suffer as a result. So I'm going to move on now to proprioception. So proprioception is sometimes called body awareness. It's calibration of force, body position, muscle tension, and body movement. So proprio is the Greek word for self, and ception is perception. So it's our perception of ourself or our perception of our physical self. So um, what happens is we have little fibers called proprioceptors in our muscles or joints and our tendons. And these are mechanosensory neurons, which means that they are sensitive to mechanical information. So body position, body movement, muscle stretch and tension, calibration of force, all those words I've just said. So what happens is these proprioceptors, they are sensitive to the movements in our muscles, our joints and our tendons. They then send information to our brain in multiple locations, like I previously said, and tell our brain what position our body's in where our body parts are relative to each other and how much force we are using. So, um, the, the verbs that, that I tend to associate with proprioception are pushing, pulling, dragging, lifting. They are all involved in proprioception. Anything that involves muscle resistance is proprioception. So what is proprioception used for in real life? Um, a good example of your proprioceptive system in action is um, eating or chewing. So if we consider a bite versus a chew, what's the difference? It's the same part of your face that's doing the work. Um, it's the same muscles involved. So how is it different? So a bite involves a strong amount of force and our jaw muscles are super strong. Um, there is some information to say that there could be over 200 pounds per square inch of force in our jaws, depending on which part of our jaw, obviously closer to the fulcrum, so closer to the, the jaw joint, the temporal mandibular joint, this is where the um, the uh, the force tends to be the strongest. So this is where our molars are. This is where we do like chewing. This is where we pulverize food and turn it into mush so we can swallow it. But then at the front of our mouth, we have our incisors, which are narrow. So the they're furthest away from the fulcrum of the jaw joint. So what happens is the, in the surface area is narrower. So the pounds per square inch is actually quite high there as well. So when we bite into something, we exert a lot of force through the jaw and through the teeth. And then what happens is we manage to tear off a piece of food. And then once the food is in your mouth, seamlessly, for most of us, I'm prone to biting the inside of my cheek. I'm sure many of you are. And um, what happens then for most of us seamlessly, our proprioceptive system switches that muscle tension to chewing, which is a smoother action than biting. Biting is quite a forceful, aggressive action and chewing is more smooth and it's more refined. So that's an interesting thing to think that our proprioceptive system can switch that quickly. Other things the proprioceptive system is responsible for is helping us grade the force of our movement. So I'm a bit of a hulk, so I tend to break things without meaning to. I tend to smash into things. I tend to crush things. I crush bowls. I snap keys in half indoors, stuff like that. Not my favorite, but hey, <laughs> that's part of my uh, part of my lived experience of my own neurodivergence. So um, other examples of refining that force could be um, holding your pencil. Do you hold it too tight when you write? Does it hurt after a while? If so, your proprioceptive system might be a little bit quirky because it should have corrected that when you were about seven years old. Other things that the proprioceptive system helps you do is it helps you do fine motor tasks like doing up buttons, doing up zips, tying laces, all that sort of stuff using cutlery. It's really quite remarkable when we consider like the fact that you can make a fit so tightly and then in the same movement you can do something loose and gentle. So um, it's really cool to see our proprioceptive system grading that force. I think that's one of the coolest things the proprioceptive system does. Um, another thing that's quite cool about the proprioceptive system is that it learns more through motor experience 
differences across the lifespan. So the more you feed your proprioceptive system, the better it gets at discerning information and sending out good information to the rest of your body. I like to compare it to Google Maps sometimes. The more information that you upload into um into your proprioceptive system, the better it is at telling your body what to do back. So it's like a loop, the information goes in and the information comes out as well. Um, another thing that I have not mentioned about the proprioceptive system is that it tends to be um, like an anchor. It anchors us in our body, especially us neurodivergent people who have a hard time with proprioception. Not being really good at body awareness does not feel that good for your self-esteem because if there's one thing you are supposed to be in control of, it is your own body. And that starts very young. That starts in infancy and moves all the way up through childhood so an example would be have you ever seen a very young baby like moving their hand and looking at it like whoa this is the most amazing thing ever that's the proprioceptive system learning oh my god this hand is actually under my conscious control I can be the person or I can be the thing that governs this and that's quite a cool experience at least judging by the facial expressions babies make when they discover this so um, managing the proprioceptive system in real life, think resistance, think of your muscles, think how hard they work. So um, pushing, pulling, dragging, lifting, like I mentioned, like carrying groceries, that's quite a heavy proprioceptive task, pushing a buggy, pushing a pram, pushing a trolley, using your muscles in any way. And this helps us feel anchored and present in our bodies. Um, sometimes we um, forget that the proprioceptive system does other things in terms of like postural stability. So if I'm sitting up right now, I'm sitting on the edge of my bed, so I don't have like anything behind me to keep me upright. So the muscles in my core are working against gravity to keep me up so sometimes the resistance that we are experiencing is literally just gravity other times the resistance might be a barbell or something heavy like weight training trx uh, crossfit um swimming um rugby anything that involves heavy muscle um resistance heavy muscle contraction so as a dyspraxic person um the weightlifting has been quite a life changer for me so um i think i'm good at it because i uh, i'm under responsive to proprioceptive information which means that i can exert a large amount of force sometimes by accident so i actually have a gold medal from the powerlifting federation of northern ireland which um was a big shock to me as a dyspraxic person i had never won anything in a sporting event before but the resistance is something that I, whatever about the physical impact it has on me, the biggest thing that this heavy resistance does for me is it is my mental health. It really helps me manage that. It quiets the voice in my head. I'm sure there are multiple neurodivergent people out there who, like me, experience constant ongoing multiple thoughts at once i find it really difficult to process an individual thought at one time there's always like eight or nine going at once but when i'm lifting a barbell that's heavy enough literally the only thing i can think about is how to get that barbell moving and that's it it's a complete brain holiday so i do advise um resistance of any sort for anybody who experiences that type of uh, brain activity like i do so that's the proprioceptive system so I'm going to talk about our sense of touch now. So tactile. So this is how we interpret touch and input from our skin. So um, I did mention that there are other forms of um, sensory processing that I didn't include in my little summary at the beginning. And within the tactile system, there are some subsets, one of them being thermoception, which is our sense of temperature. Then there's also nociception, which is our sense of pain. And there's also, um, there's different forms of like light touch and deep touch as well. So um, the information in, gets in through um, the um, sensory receptors in our skin and in our dermis, which is the layer below the skin. And sometimes there's an overlap where we get a thing called myodermal pressure, which to the layman is deep pressure. So that's where the skin and the muscle are both um, experiencing pressure so it's a pressure sense so it experiences pressure and then it sends information to your brain about the touch that you are experiencing so um, a lot of neurodivergent people are quirky in their sense of touch I know I am and um, so this varies on our moods and our relationships and how well we feel and this is so interesting I think people um, often think of sensory posting as like a static thing and it really isn't it's so variable so even for an individual within a day your sensory processing will change multiple times so um, a good example of um, how your sense of touch changes based on your physical wellness is, um, I don't know um, if anybody had 
side effects to any of the um, the COVID vaccines, but I had the AstraZeneca back in March and I had very sensitive skin um, afterwards, which would be a flu symptom. Um, so like my clothes didn't feel, and I would be fussy about my clothes textures anyway, but my clothes did not feel comfortable on my skin. They felt like they were burning. My skin felt like it was burning. And I've experienced that before with other like sicknesses. So um, that would be a change in your tactile processing. Um, another thing is like your relationships. So there are people in my life that I really care about and that I'm very close to, and I will let them touch me like gently or lightly, you know, like with a, a gentle touch. But if somebody that I wasn't very close to did that, and I mean, even this includes friends, so I'm sorry, um, I would have a quite a, a startle response. Like I would get quite a... Um, uh, for me, it's like a skin crawling response. I have had clients, um, I had a child once tell me it felt like his nerves were spitting. And I thought, wow, that is a really interesting way to describe it. So our sense of touch is so deeply personal and it's really variable. So again, like somebody that I really, um, like for example, my partner, if he were to touch me lightly on the arm, I would not have a startle response. But if a friend did, I would have a startle response. Um, and it's hard for people maybe not to take that personally sometimes but it really isn't and um, this again is another evolutionary survival um instinct that we have so our sense of touch back when we were still living in caves living in forests or whatever it was that we were doing back in back in the day back in prehistoric times if something touched us lightly there was a good chance that it was a threat for example it may have been a poisonous insect in which case we should have had that smack response maybe if we were hunting and we were stationed really still and we felt something touch against us lightly maybe it was a predator moving in the foliage and it was the foliage moving against us i currently have goosebumps from talking about this so that's how sensitive the tactile system can be it can also have an anticipatory response so an example of that would be right now me talking about it and I am covered in goosebumps and feeling a little bit skin crawly and flappy uh, another example would be if um if you're reading something and a person is reading over your shoulder that is definitely a time when I would contemplate murder and it feels like such an overreaction but somebody looking over my shoulder ooh, ooh, they don't even have to touch me and it makes me feel like very very disgusted so um and I think that's a fairly common one other things that our sense of touch can affect is our tolerance for um different food textures because food is like I said it's a multi-sensory experience and one of the one of the sensory experiences involved in eating is how does the food feel in my mouth? So for me, uh, yogurt is an unbearable um, texture. I think it's absolutely repulsive, but I like strong, crunchy foods that require a lot of chewing. Hey, proprioception, come on in. So uh, there's a lot of um, overlap again. So um, I know that many um, neurodivergent people will talk about particular food preferences. Then it can also affect things like, you know, uh, like clothing preferences. Personally, I always wear a vest under my clothes because I don't like the feel of most uh, fabrics. Um, other things might be... Um, some people like loose clothes, some people like tight clothes. I know some people who wear under armor under all of their clothes. Um, and then other things would be uh, grooming tasks, such as having your nails cut, having your hair cut. I know until very recently, I had an intense aversion to having my hair cut. I'm sure you can see uh, this. It's hard enough to handle, but I don't like strangers touching my head. Um, I felt like the person was too close to me. You can hear the snip snip of the scissors near your ear. Hair cutting being an unpleasant experience is not unusual amongst the neurodivergent population. And I know for sure some of you can relate to that. Um, so deep touch touch versus light touch. So deep touch is the myodermal pressure I was talking about. And it tends to be soothing or relaxing, like a deep, tight hug, a heavy massage stuff like that and um, being grabbed firmly as opposed to that kind of light kind of uh, skittery touch so that's the light touch which tends to make us feel very alert so there's actually some interesting research on this one as well where they looked at um, skin conductivity so that is how much electricity does the skin conduct and the thing is in the high stress state we conduct electricity quicker through our skin. I know that's amazing, isn't it? We're so electric. Um, so with light touch, they noticed that for certain individuals that the skin conductivity increased, which was a really, really, really solid indicator of stress being increased. So that's, uh, that's uh, some information on the tactile system. So 
the auditory system is how we respond to what we hear and how we interpret it. The auditory system, like the tactile system, is a response to pressure stimulus. So with the tactile system, the pressure is on the surface of the skin or on the muscles underneath the skin. And with auditory processing, the pressure is experienced in the ear and on the eardrum. So we have the hammer, the anvil and the, um, the eardrum, and they are obviously the bones, the smallest bones in the body in the ear, and they bounce off of each other and smack the eardrum, and they bounce off of each other in response to um, vibrations on the air, which is how we catch sound. And then that information is sent to our brain and our brain figures out what to do with that information. So um, there's another form of conduction for auditory information, and that is bone conduction. And that is where the skull or the skulls in your bones, the bones in your skulls, but <sighs> bone conduction is where the bones of your skull vibrate in response to sound and that is how it is interpreted so this tends to be quite a deep calming sensation for us so our own voice um, tends to be interpreted via bone conduction that's why we sound differently when we hear ourselves recorded back I know when I watch this video back I'm going to get a shock over how I sound it happens every time um, but that's because I will be hearing my own voice via air conduction instead of via bone conduction so what happens with bone conduction is that it can be calming and soothing as well so a really common one is like there are many people who hum as a form of self calming humming can be a form of stimming I know I'm quite um I did that a lot as a child a lot of humming like in the back of my throat I still do it sometimes and it was a soothing thing so it was a soothing stim for me where I would hum and the information was then traveling through my, the bones of my skull to my brain and the sound was being interpreted that way. Another cool thing about that, if you're really stressed by sound, is that that does tend to drown out other sounds because bone conduction tends to be stronger than air conduction. So humming in the back of your throat or that humming that we sometimes do when we're stressed, that can filter out other auditory sounds that are um, distressing to us. The auditory system is also, again, connected to our um, survival as a species. And um, sudden sounds cause us to startle. Fair enough, that would be a threat. So if a bang happened, I would jump and maybe, stupid me, I'd probably run towards it. But I think um, most people would run away from it um, or maybe grab something to, to hit the source of the sound. Um, there can also be certain types of sounds that bother us. So what's interesting is when you are auditory sensitive or auditory defensive, sometimes people tend to be uh, confused about how that is for you because it's not always about the volume of the sound or the loudness of the sound. For example, I quite happily listen to heavy metal on a pretty high volume, especially with my earphones, having a great time, but like an alarm clock, especially a beeping alarm clock will, um, highly stress me out um, house alarms car alarms all that sort of stuff that high pitch beeping that for me is my own personal hell and um, other things would be like a jackhammer those are sounds that I find really difficult to process and for each person that would be individual what they can tolerate and what they can't tolerate how much information they filter in or out for example if you are in a busy classroom a busy lecture theater a busy office um, or even working from home when your family are there you might find that background noises maybe you're able to filter them out and focus on what you're supposed to be focusing on or maybe you might find that um you can't and I, I find it harder unless I'm in like what I would call a, a flow state which is where you're super engaged in something and maybe experiencing a bit of hyper focus but I'm less in that state the background noise will be intensely irritable to me I don't know if you can hear right now that my neighbor's doing a bit of DIY and it is um making me quite mad so I'm trying to filter that out as I talk so the auditory sense is really cool. Um, and we also have, like I mentioned, like that synesthetic response to like auditory information that is language. We interpret that in very interesting ways and we interpret that to have meaning and we interpret that to, you know, contribute to our social connections and our understanding of lots of things. Um, and then aside from all of that, um, auditory information can be intensely pleasurable. There are many of us who really enjoy music. You know, there are other sounds that are deeply pleasurable to us. I know for me, um, one of my kind of sensory resets or my sensory glimmers uh, as opposed to triggers is the sound of water. So I would often visit the beach, a lake, a river at the weekend to kind of get myself in a better headspace to kind of shake off the week. So the sound of water um, is something that I find really relaxing I think that's part quite a common one um so yeah again deeply personal so um 
I'm going to talk a little bit about visual processing now. So this is how the brain processes visual information. So it interprets, analyzes, and understands the visual information. So it's not the same as visual acuity, which is related to eyesight. So visual acuity is basically how accurate is your vision. Visual processing is once the information gets into the brain, what does the brain do with it? So we have many forms of this visual processing. It's super complicated. So I'm only going to go into this a little bit. It probably would not be my biggest area area of expertise but the visual system um basically we see things and then our brain figures it out so um sometimes we decode or decipher things for example i'm looking at my screen like right now and there are there are letters on my screen there are shapes and those shapes are letters and so what they do is they come together and they're forming words that i'm able to read and interpret so a dyslexic person may find that more difficult other things then would be numbers, obviously, and a person who experiences dyscalculia would find that more difficult as well. Um, then there's also visual spatial relationships. So like depth perception, figure ground, like if I look into a drawer that's full of stuff, um, can I find the thing I need or do I get overwhelmed? Um, a fun example of that would be where's Wally? So um, if you're looking at those very crowded visual puzzles, I used to love those as a child, um, then you will you know, you have to find Wally in the middle of it all. Um, and another thing about the visual system is that it's super connected to the vestibular system and they kind of work together gyroscopically. So what happens is your eyes either lock on a target or they move on the target. And the thing when the visual system and the vestibular system are working well together, you can separate the movements of the eyes from the movements of the head. So um, I think this is cool. I watched a documentary by Chris Packham once on Tristan, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, another autistic genius <laughs> so um basically they were talking about how tristan's eyes like predators like humans were in the front of his head pointing forward and what happens when you run and you lock in on a target for example if you're hunting something you are moving towards that target and your eyes are focused on that target but your head is moving in different ways so you might be able to see as i move my head my eyes are focused on where I think the camera is. So um, that's that gyroscopic reaction between the visual system and the vestibular system. So if that doesn't work, what happens is when we run our eyes bobble around like googly eyes and that's not very useful for us um, navigating the world. Um, other things with the visual system is light perception can be one. So I have this fun little lamp that looks like the moon. I, I love it. It's one of my favorite things that I currently own. It's definitely a stim for me and I also like the sound of it. But if I light it up this way, that's a warm yellow light. And for me, that's very pleasing and that's very soothing. But if I tap it again, like it looks more like the actual moon now, but this type of bright white light, I find obnoxious. I particularly find this obnoxious on um, in the dark. I can tolerate it now because I'm in a bright enough room, but we sometimes find that um, neurodivergent people are light sensitive. So um, driving at night or being in a car at night, especially when you are in the countryside and there are cars coming towards you on the opposite side of the road, the newer cars with the blue tinted LED lights, I would personally experience that as pain and that might end up being a migraine for me. So whoever invented those, I hate you. Just putting that out there. So uh, we can be very sensitive to light as well. So yeah. Um, another thing I wanted to mention about the visual process or the visual system is um, visual stims as well. I love a visual stim. One of my favorite things is miniatures. I love to examine things. I love to peer at things up close. I love to really, uh, you know, get a good, 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 like stare at something if I'm really interested in it. And uh, my brain just really likes that. And a lot of neurodivergent people might find that, you know, visual stims might be something that they really like. You know, another thing would be straight lines or a common one. But for me, my biggest one would be um, looking at things up close. And like on that note, even looking at beautiful art, looking at, you know, things that we find pleasing, that's a visual stim. Um, a very normal visual stim, but, you know, we talk about stimming in a pathologizing way as opposed to it being the norm, which it actually is because all humans stim, like I mentioned, sensory experience and beings in a sensory producing world. We have no choice. So olfactory and gustatory, I'm gonna lump in together. So that's smell and taste. Been a lot of talk about those with this pandemic where people have lost their sense of smell and taste. I think prior to that, people maybe didn't really realize how important they are. Um, I know someone close to me lost their sense of smell and taste and it really uh, affected their enjoyment in life because food and nice smells are really important. Um, again, smell and taste are evolutionary traits that we, um, 
used to bring us thus far and humans are still around so it was successful so smell is um obviously through our nose and what happens is we smell in we smell different environmental um stimuli and our brain decides whether it's a good smell or a bad smell and i'm sitting here with a scented candle because this is helping me feel a little bit relaxed while i'm giving this talk um, i'm also very um olfactory sensitive so my sense of smell is very sensitive and that can be very distressing sometimes you know um like bad smells can be very noxious you know um and they can have an effect on our physical reactions for example some of us gag when something smells really bad other things are like you know um smell can be part of attraction as well you know when you're really into a person and you like how they smell that's like that's part of your attraction to them and um, other things are smell can tell you um when something has gone off smell can tell you um if you shouldn't be in a certain place you know even stuff like the smell of natural gas i know that's added in i know that's not the real smell but we interpret that as a warning to oh something's gone wrong and we need to do something about it. Um, so our sense of smell is quite cool. I put smell and taste together because they're so connected. So our sense of smell, we're actually, um, well, humans have a very sensitive sense of smell. Obviously there are, are other creatures who really beat us hands down in terms of smell. For example, dogs um, have very sensitive smell. They do a lot of like navigating by their nose, which is quite interesting. But sense of, uh, our sense of smell and our sense of taste are really, really connected. So our taste really relies on smell a lot. I know we have taste buds in our tongue, but our olfactory bulb is um, a cluster of um, neurons that basically um, processes smell and it's actually connected to taste as well. So that's quite cool. And um, so sense as our sense of smell and taste are very, um, they can cause us to experience a lot of pleasure, but they can also experience or cause us to experience a lot of disgust as well. So um, I'm going to talk about interoception now. So interoception is Latin for looking inside. So this is quite interesting. Interoception is not talked about very much, I don't think, but it's information about our internal states. So stuff like hunger, thirst, fatigue, our sleep-wake cycle, our need to go to the bathroom, that should not say plain, that should, should, so it should say pain, um, pleasure, etc. Those are all parts of our interoception. So interoception um, can be quirky for neurodivergent people. I know for me, my sense of pain is a little bit dodge. Sometimes I have a pain and I can't locate it. Um, another thing that's quite common is neurodivergent people can struggle to regulate our sleep wake cycle and there's a lot of like neurochemical stuff happening there, as well as a lot of like behavioral stuff and environmental factors. Other things are if I am really stuck into the zone and experienced in hyper focus, I might forget to drink, I tend to not go to the bathroom in that time frame. Um, I also tend to withhold that until I'm like done. So um, hunger is uh, an interesting one as well. Some neurodivergent people don't feel hunger the way neurotypicals expect us to. Um, so interoception is really interesting and when it's out of whack it can kind of impact on our self-care. So sometimes what happens is we need to actually actively remind ourselves. You know um, sometimes I think I really benefit from being at work because my eating times are structured so I have a designated lunch time and a designated time where I can like have breakfast and then dinner uh, tends to be whenever because I have free time then. So um, but for some of us like scheduling these things is actually helpful and for some of us it's not so helpful I know for me sleep um, has always been a very significant issue for me I've had insomnia for as long as I can remember even as a child I've had two sleep studies done on me and they very very informatively told me that I have insomnia I knew that anyway um I currently take melatonin to help regulate that but I don't take anything else I find my stress impacts a lot on my sleep as well and I tend to experience a lot of stress about sleep for example um you know when you're starting to do the mental countdown of if I go to sleep now I will have five hours sleep and then you don't get the five hours because you keep um you keep checking in and doing the countdown which keeps you awake so yeah uh so um these are things that neurodivergent people can find are a little bit quirky so you sometimes hear oh you know your child will eat when they're hungry well your neurodivergent child might not so you know you might want to think a little bit about different ways to approach this
So um, I wanted to talk about praxis. So praxis is something that we talk about in the context of dyspraxia. So dyspraxia means difficulty with praxis. But praxis is a very, um, a very interesting process. So it's a three-step neurological process consisting of ideation, knowing what needs to be done, planning how to perform the task or putting all the steps into place and execution, which is the end result and actually finally doing it. So dyspraxic people tend to have a hard time with the ideation and the planning, but what we see is the end result, so that's the execution. So as a dyspraxic person myself, I know that my praxis it impacts my work coordination, but it also impacts on organization, planning, sequencing, following multiple part instructions and time management, because those all require praxis as well. So those are the misunderstood elements of um of dyspraxia it's not just about being clumsy there's a lot more to it there's also an element of praxis in language so we tend to construct our language we put our language together like building blocks and then that involves praxis and um, praxis is also involved in moving the muscles of your mouth your tongue and your throat to speak correctly I've had some speech and language therapy myself because you can hear it now my vocal cords get constricted because I talk in a way that actually isn't very healthy for them um that can be a neurodivergent thing as well. So um, dyspraxia is often talked about um, as being the difficulty with praxis, but anybody can struggle with praxis from time to time. Um, especially neurodivergent people, we can be quirky in our praxis, even if we are not dyspraxic. So filtering, I have touched on a little bit. So filtering um, means when we are experiencing background sensory stimulus or stimuli, it's always stimuli, it's never stimulus. Um, stimuli, we are, we are filtering out a lot of the background information. So for example, right now, I'm filtering out some background noise. Um, it's mostly gone now, but there was background noise earlier. Other things that I'm filtering out would be, um, I'm not filtering them now that I'm talking about them, but I had been filtering them out maybe with the smell of the candle that became a sort of a background um, stimulus, stimulus for me. Other things that I'm currently filtering out would be um, what's happening outside. I'm sitting near a window. I know there's stuff going on outside, but I'm not actually looking at it. Um, so for example, I mentioned being in an office, at classroom or a lecture theater or maybe working from home there are background um sensory stimuli that we need to filter out in order to focus and this can be really difficult for us like our, our filter can be quite thin when we are um, neurodivergent so that can result in sensory overload happening quite quickly and that can cause us to experience shutdown meltdown stress anxiety anger irritation fatigue all that sort of stuff. Um, so filtering is something that is quite important that we are able to do, but some of us do find it difficult. So um, this is a little graphic I found, I cannot take credit for this, but I found this on the internet and I just loved it because the brain looks so startled by this sensory tsunami coming up behind it. So um, I know for me, um, I will experience a sensory tsunami if my clothes don't fit well, if my clothes don't overlap with each other. What I mean by that is if there are gaps in my clothes, um, for example, if my T-shirt and my trousers don't meet, that will drive me crazy. And that will just be kind of a background irritation for me throughout the day. Um, but then that might mean that other things um, will, will affect me more that maybe wouldn't. So um, add in an alarm to that. Um, add in maybe the temperature isn't what I like, maybe I'm hungry, maybe I haven't slept, then I'm more likely to experience overload, irritation, and um, that sort of stuff. You might have to have a wee cry, you know, yourself. So um, the brain is overwhelmed in that scenario. So you will know yourself what you experience as a sensory overload. So on that note, the emotional sensory cup is something that's really important. So the emotional sensory cup sort of fills over the day. So for example, if I have this cup here, it's, it's quite full. I was supposed to drink it and I didn't, I will. Um, but basically, um, if you consider you start your day usually with a mostly empty cup. So what we want is we never want the cup to overflow because if the cup overflows, what happens is we go into dysregulation or we can, if the cup overflows, we can get shut down, meltdown, anger, sadness, exhaustion, stress, all that sort of bad stuff that we don't like to have. So um, for example, if you haven't slept well, that might put a certain amount in your cup. Maybe um, someone shouted at you in the morning. That's my worst time. <laughs> a little bit more in the cup. Um, maybe I um, was late for work 
um, a little bit more in the cup. So all this sort of stuff, maybe there was a beeping going on in the background, maybe someone's house alarm was going off and it was going off for a long time, a little bit more in the cup. Maybe um, my trousers, maybe it was raining and my trousers got wet when I went outside, a little bit more in the cup. Um, and the cup fills, 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 and it overflows unless you manage to empty it and you empty it by doing something positive or regulating. So um, other things that might fill the cup quickly might be a lot of language because that takes a fair bit of cognitive processing. Maybe somebody's talking to you too much and you're just like, just cannot process what you're saying. So that can cause your cup to overflow and that can be um, a real problem. So we kind of, we want a little bit in the cup, but we don't want the cup to overflow. And we have to consider everybody's cup is a different size. So, you know, your cup might be bigger than somebody else's or it might be smaller. So we can't say, oh, look, I don't know why you're so stressed by this. Sure, I experienced the same thing and I'm fine. That's a, a bit of a shit thing to say, but it really doesn't um, have any relevance to another person's experience. So um, in your cup, it's important to notice what times during the day you struggle most or what times you're at your best. For me, I struggle the most in the morning. So I tend to try to do as much as possible the night before. Um, I'm going to say this so smugly as if I do this all the time. But in an ideal scenario, I would have my... Um, my things ready the night before because evening time tends to not be that stressful for me I tend to be fairly chilled out um in kind of mid to late evening so um in that time if I'm if I'm being good um or taking care of myself and I tend to try and think of this as a form of self-care I will um pack my bag for work I will um make sure that my uniform is ready for work I will even have my breakfast made or ready it doesn't have to be made but it has to be ready at least planned um, I also like it might even go so far as putting toast in the toaster and then in the morning I just have to press the button um, but um, other things might be even getting my lunch ready all that sort of stuff and um, the night before so in the morning when I am probably not at my best I have only a little bit to do so um, I tend to wake up quite early anyway but I don't tend to use my time very wisely so if I do it the night before um, I tend to have a better day so that means that my cup has less in it in the morning so work around the times that you struggle and maximize on the times that you don't struggle um so be prepared if you can be um other things are um like factor in the times um, or factor in the fact that or factor in stresses factor in the the um the eventuality that you're going to have um something going into your cup that's negative and also make sure that you factor in break time and rest time that's really important um and then other things that you can do is like like i mentioned for me a sensory reset is going to um to visit water so if that's something i can do i do i do um so do what you can it might even be like i tend to go for a walk at lunchtime as well that kind of resets me um sometimes i'll go get a fizzy drink i'm a devil for a fizzy drink um i'll go get a fizzy drink at lunchtime if i need to give myself a little pick me up so you get to decide what are the things that help you manage what's in your sensory emotional cup so um the other thing that we have to consider with senses is the impact of the environment. We can't really change our sensory process and we can help it with lifestyle management and we can use like sensory integration to help the central nervous system process some of the information better. But realistically, the environment is always going to be part of our sensory process and, and the environment is always going to be a big job for us to process. So um, I thought this um, this was reflections of a bear.com i thought this was pretty cool because the bear here is obviously experiencing overload you can see the cogs turning in the bear's body and there's like a, what appears to be a tornado over the bear's head i can relate to the thought tornado so um you can see all of these things um happening in the bear's environment that are contributing to overload or meltdown so small things even like a breeze moved your hair the light changed color really bright light or music a bird chirping bad perfume i know for me um lush is an environment that i can't tolerate and um, not just because the smell is too strong for me but also um visually it's very alarming and there's always a lot of people in it and somebody always approaches you to ask you if you need help and i at that point i'm very irritated so i actually just don't go near it so anyway um other things could be you know um your clothes might be bothering you um there could be someone smoking near you maybe the smell of the grass bothers you personally i like that but whatever the environment is always going to contribute to this and it's, it's important to like change the environment if you can like tailor your environment as much as possible if you can um 
So um, this is an example. Um, some people would be fine with this. And I feel sometimes like my natural state is to go towards the messy one or to make that my life look like that. But I perform better in a tidier environment. So um, that's uh, another thing. Like it's very visually cluttered. Um, it's probably quite difficult to move around that environment as well. So um, maybe it doesn't smell too good. Um, so the one on the right, I'm assuming looking at it, that it's um, obviously it's less visually cluttered. I'm assuming it probably smells a bit fresh and um, maybe it's easier to get around all that sort of stuff is kind of eliminated so I'm a big fan of saying control what you can so control the controllables in your life so um, I stole this from Evelyn from Autumn Training because I think Evelyn has some really fantastic information but this particular one stimming as a functional activity I really wanted to include because stimming is sensory and again I would like to just reiterate that I hate sensory being used as a buzzword, but stimming is a sensory stimulating activity. So there's lots of functions and Evelyn has some eight functions here to soothe, to stimulate, to express emotions, to communicate, to take information, to process information, to store information and to recall information. And similar to all humans being sensory experiencing creatures in a sensory filled world, we are all stimmers. We all do self-stimulatory behavior, eating when you're not hungry, eating for pleasure, that's stimming. Um, watching TV is stimming, listening to music is stimming, anything that gives you sensory stimulation is stimming. We really uh, tend to pathologize stimming, especially autistic or neurodivergent and ADHD stimming. So for example, motor stims like rocking, like um, moving backwards and forwards, pacing, stuff like that, those tend to be seen as they're pathologized and they don't need to be. Other things are, you know, using fidgets. I tend to have a fair amount of fidgets around me. Um, so those things are all um, pathologized when they don't really need to be, like they don't cause harm. The vast majority of stims are not harmful to the person stimming or to the people around them. So they should be left alone. Um, other forms of stimming can be vocal or verbal stimming, which I, I tend to do quite a lot at home. Um, I tend to, like I enjoy a good verbal stim, um, an auditory stim. I would, might listen to the same song over and over. Um, when I was younger, I could um, identify uh, periods of my life by what movie I watched over and over. Um, it was Darby O'Gill and the Little People and Gladiator when I was in primary school. Then it was March of the Penguins and Apocalypto, The Birdcage, um, then Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. And then in college, it was <laughs> Edward Scissorhands, but only as far as the robbery scene because I couldn't tolerate it anymore. So um, yeah, those are those were some of my, uh, like those were visual and auditory statements as well, but also they were soothing and they were, um, quite repetitive for me, I suppose, but stimming is functional. Stimming isn't harmful. So stimming is important. Um, I have a real problem when people ask to reduce or eliminate stims. It's not ethical. It's not person-centered and it's really never okay unless somebody is um, actively harming themselves. So in conclusion, all humans are sent to experience them and all environments are sent to provoking. So to say that, you know, we are, sorry, I'm one second. So in conclusion, all humans are sensory experiencing and all environments are sensory provoking. All of our experiences or the vast majority of them will give us some form of sensory stimulation or will cause us to produce them. Um, each individual sensory experience are unique to them. We can't truly know what another perceives. So there's no such thing as saying that a person's sensory processing is wrong, but it is important to note that negative sensory experiences result in stress, pain, anxiety, sadness, meltdown, shutdown, and all that sort of negative things that we don't want. So sensory processing is very important. Um, tailoring the environment when you can is really important to help you manage what you can so that you control the controllables. Um, and it is widely acknowledged that neurodivergent people experience sensory information differently to neurotypicals. That does not make us wrong, it just makes us different. And that's what makes us amazing. So thank you for listening to me. Um, I know I did a bit of an info dump on sensory processing. I probably could have talked about it longer, but here we are. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me um, on the Horizon social media. Um, thank you.